all of your stories are unique and becoming more unique because, well, every time they're changed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that makes it extra unique. You just change, change it a little bit to make it more interesting. <laughs> so this is Thanksgiving weekend 2016, and Ralph Sweet's going to tell some stories about uh, his childhood. So, Dad, can you tell us about uh, life on the Arizona Inn? Well, some of the things I can remember, it, it was a, an inn where people could come there and stay overnight. They could come there just for meals, uh, whatever they needed to while they were there. The thing is that there was stagecoach days. The Highway 101 was called the Roosevelt Highway at that time. The Roosevelt Highway had not even been paved at all through uh, the time that I lived there. So they ended up uh, paving it and along about 1928 or something like that is when they paved it. And it was just a gravel road at that time and was uh, turnouts for when the cars would meet another vehicle to let somebody go around. Where was the Arizona Inn? The Arizona Inn is 15 miles south of Port Orford. And the place that it's known as now is the Dinosaur Park. Hmm. It's on the edge of it. The Arizona Inn wasn't that back in the stagecoach era where they had an inn like a day's horse ride or a stagecoach ride, so there was a place for somebody to stay like you left one in, you traveled by stagecoach all day, and then there was an inn at the end of the day. Isn't no, that pretty really much what the Arizona Inn? That's why it was located where it was. Yeah, because <laughs> it was just halfway between uh, Port Orford and Gold Beach, and so they pulled down to there and stay overnight or whatever they were planning on doing, and then the next day they'd get up and uh, travel on to where they were headed to before. So your customers at the Arizona Inn, a lot of them would ride by stagecoach. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you guys take care of the horses or who took care of the horses, that sort of thing? It was up to the drivers to take care of their own horses. But they would uh, oftentimes get their hay from dad. Of course, that was a problem, always trying to be sure that there was enough feed in this, but especially when they'd have a big cattle drive coming through there, uh, traveling from Eureka to the Coquille River. So it's a regular cattle drive, kind of like a Texas cattle drive, only up what's now 101. That's right. It, it was up the Roosevelt Highway to get up there. And they were taking these cattle on up to the Coquille Valley where they had bought ranches in there to be able to put them on. There'd be maybe 50 to 75 cows all being driven at once through there. The cowboys keeping them in line, making them stay on the road and all that sort of thing. I can remember I had to be sure that when we heard the cattle coming, that I was supposed to shut the gate that came into the Arizona end itself. And I'd shut the gate down, I'd climb up on the gate and get way up above the cows and watch them all go by. <laughs> it was an interesting thing to watch that. But you closed the gate so the cows didn't come in and eat your feet. Yes, right. So uh, they didn't eat the whole, all the, all the grass that's available in our pastures there. When those cattle would go by, there would be literally 50 of them at a time be moving as they went along, walking along, and boy, I'll tell you, it was, it was a noisy thing to see all of them going by. And uh, almost all of them had horns, too, and that would just scare the heck out of you. If you'd fall off in front of them, they'd jab you with a horn. <laughs> <laughs> tell us your siblings' names. Okay, uh, my older sister is Neonda, and then my other sister, her name was Effie. And then Sid was born after they were here. And then I was the last one born at Langless. 
but the Arizona Inn, what you what you kids do for? How'd you help out? Neonna was old enough that she helped a lot with the cooking, helped to serve it, and that sort of thing. And uh, Effie uh, didn't do much of that. She she uh, always was accused of leaving her work to be done by somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, both Sid and I uh, eventually learned to milk a cow. Dad made us a milk stool apiece and a uh, one-legged milk stool around like your it. waist. Mm -hmm. We had one old cow there that uh, named, uh, well, I don't remember her name right now. I might get back to that later. <laughs> anyway, she was, um, very gentle, and we could milk on both sides of her, and she wouldn't kick us at all or anything like that. She just uh, was extremely gentle. M Molly was her name. Yeah. And uh, so when I was six years old, Dad started us learning how to uh, milk that cow, and uh, I, we just, I, we just milked her only for about a year. And then finally, uh, Dad thought, well, we're good enough that we can't milk and we can take on another one apiece. And so he just said, okay, you're going to milk that one and that one. I remember how I hated to have to milk more cows. But at the same time, that was the way families did things in those days. <coughs> The Arizona Inn worked as an inn for several years there, and then uh, they finally got to where the, the highway was good enough that they paved the highway along about 1930, something like that. But up until then, it was just a graveled road, and made an excellent supply for gravel to, for a slingshot. <laughs> I always had a pocket full of gravel <laughs> to be able to shoot my slingshot. <laughs> so what did you shoot with your slingshot? Oh, any little bird that wiggled or any, anything else, or if there was a window that hadn't been broken yet, what we saw of that happening too. <laughs> So, with intent up. and malice, you <laughs> shot a glass window. How many of them did you shoot? Well, did you leave any standing? No. <laughs> <laughs> the schoolhouse that used to be there at the Arizona the end was all glass windows, a little narrow ones, you know, and uh, they were on the west wall of that schoolhouse. And we saw to it that every one of those windows got broken out. Both Sid and I did. And I didn't take all the blame for that. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up with one of these in my pocket all the time. And if there was a little birdie, a birdie sitting out there, I would just kind of <laughs> and let it go. And oh, <laughs> by putting a rock inside this piece of leather here, oh. and then aiming it out there. Oh. <laughs> okay. Okay, then you pull it and then let it go. Boing! That was Grandpa's toy and hunting device when he was little. It was interesting uh, that other than that, we'd shoot at birds and Dad was very adamant about not shooting the swallows because they would light on the telephone wires and went across there. And uh, we'd shoot at those all the time. We got to where there would be very few of them left anymore. But if Dad would really come after us for shooting those things. If you see one of them uh, falling from a telephone wire, he was very upset with us. And his, his interpretation always was, I'm going to get a club after you. <laughs> Never did, but that was his version of what he, how he should take care of us. <laughs> Did you ever have any unusual guests? What kind of people stayed at the end? 
Yeah, we had some very unusual ones. Uh, there were people that would come all the way from the East Coast and end up wanting to stay as near the Cape Blanco as they could. And uh, when they'd get to the Arizona end, they'd say, that's close enough. We'll be, be glad to stay here. Well, I never will forget there was a family that came there and asked if they could camp on the beach out in front of the house down there. And uh, Dad said, no, sure, go ahead. It's all right. But he said, don't mind those seahorses very much because they come up and graze around in the fields around there. And they might possibly step on you, but I doubt if they will. They're pretty cautious about that. And if you're sleeping right there, well, they probably would be pretty careful not to walk on you. And those people got so scared that they decided we don't want to sleep on the beach ever. <laughs> Not whatever there might be a seahorse there. <laughs> it was uh, a very different world that we were living in down there. And uh, people that would come in on the stage, uh, they would only just stay there for maybe an hour, an hour and a half, would be about the most they'd be there. And then there was the only occupations that there were down there is. There were sawmills, I think there were three or four different sawmills in there, and uh, they would hire maybe up to six people for each sawmill. And so those people would uh, take up a residence there and sleep sleep in uh, the quarters that we had for them. At the Arizona Inn? At the Arizona Inn. And uh, that usually ended up that they would sleep in what later became a store, uh, that they uh, would sleep in that store building because we could set up maybe eight or ten cots in there and they could uh, uh, all sleep there. Did you ever have a hair-raising story at the beach? Yes, we did. <laughs> did everybody live? Everybody made it through it, but what happened was his mom decided that she was going to take Sid and I to the beach just because the surf was real heavy and she wanted us to see it. So she took us down to the beach and if you aren't familiar with the way that the, the configuration of the beach at the Arizona Inn, that there was a big sandy beach and then there was a high cliff that uh, stood there. And if you get up past the end of that high cliff and a big breaker would come in, what are you gonna do? Well, mom had both Sid and I up alongside of that high cliff and here came a big breaker in. And it took Sid back out to sea with it when it, when it went back out. And she had me by the hair to hold me up there. And then the next breaker that came in, Sid was on it and uh, she grabbed him by the hair and held on to him until it went out. And then she got us out of there and uh, away from that cliff. She shouldn't have had us in there in the first place. <laughs> How old were you guys then? I think I was maybe four, possibly five, and Sid would have been either five or six, something like that. I can see you're still missing a little hair where you're yeah, she, grabbed she got, she got a lot of it. <laughs> At least she saved you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what about the musicians uh, and the honor playing the piano? A whole bunch of musicians came by one time and they stopped and stayed at the end. And then they played all kinds of 1920 jazz music. Well, Neola could play the piano already. It didn't make any difference to her what it was. All she had to hear was, this is what the music sounds like. And then she, after they were gone, she could sit there and play all of it back again. So she never had music lessons. She no. couldn't read music. She played no. by ear. Just played by ear only on the piano and uh, 
It was unreal to listen to her play because she could just come right back. To the, as soon as those musicians left, she could sit there and play every cam tune they played, which was, you know, maybe 15 or 20 of them that they'd played, and she'd play all of them right back again. She's pretty amazing. What'd your mom think of that? She thought that was terrible. She was going to make me want to quit that and to start taking music lessons. <laughs> because of the jazz. Yeah, because it was jazz music, and they music she, of the devil, right? Yeah. <laughs> she she uh, just didn't think that that was a cricket for you know to be able to play that kind of stuff, and so she, she was going to insist that she not do it. Well, then the next thing. She knew, you know, they knew all that music, and that's the only kind she'd ever play. <laughs> so, what year did you move to the mouth of Sixes River? Well, in was 1936. Oh, so you said the Depression hit while you were still living at the Arizona Inn. Yes, yeah, it, right. it hit while we were living at the Arizona Inn. And that just Inn. slowed everything down, brother. It did. It just, it just shot down everything. And I know that Dad had a whole bunch of just shack type of cabins that were around there. And he would uh, rent those things to anybody that wanted them. And uh, they could just rent the shack for maybe five dollars a month or something like that, you know, it was hardly anything, but it was a little bit of income that Dad could get by renting those things out. And uh, it was quite unbelievable how many people would come through there with no work at all. And during the Depression, there's hundreds of people that were traveling both ways on 101. They were going from Seattle to San Francisco or San Francisco to Seattle and they had to walk every step of the way. There was no transportation for them because they didn't have any money anyway. They didn't have anything to buy transportation with. You've heard the hobo pack over your shoulder yeah. with, on a stick. Did That's, you really see that? Oh, you bet. Every one of them had something like that that he was carrying. So they didn't have backpacks back then. They, they really had a stick with a... That's right. They just had a stick that they'd tie a, a whole big rag or a half a sheet or something. They'd put all their belongings in that and then they'd tie it up to it with that stick and they'd put that over their shoulder. That's the way they could travel. So what did you do when those people came by and didn't have any money to pay and they were hungry? Depending on the time of year that it was. If the orchard had a bunch of ripe apples out there, we just tell them to go out there and just pick all the apples you want. Because our orchard was... We'd give, you'd give them to them so they'd yeah, have something give, to eat, they could have an apple to eat. Yeah, they'd, they'd uh, maybe take ten apples with them and uh, on their way again. Uh, otherwise, if there was somebody who would come by during the middle of the day and wanted to soup or sandwich or anything he could get, then they'd usually ask him to split some kidling or split some wood and fill the wood box up. And then mom would give them their sandwich or their soup or whatever they had available at the time. That was really quite an unbelievable turn of events that Big Depression was. And every time you'd see two people meet any place, the first thing they'd say, boy, isn't this the hardest times that you ever saw? That uh, it's just no jobs, nothing to work, nothing to do. And uh, they didn't even have those little sawmills during the Depression. They just disappeared. Yeah. On south from the Arizona Inn was a place called Frankport. And Frankport was, it was actually a, a going port at that time. And it was a deep water port where all they'd have to do was tie the ship up in some manner to keep it from hitting the rocks. Down there at Frankport, they uh, had ships come in that would load with tan oak bark. And uh, this tan oak was 
peeled up on Muscle Creek and Myrtle Creek. And they'd peel the bark off the tree up there, and then they'd, they had a little short railroad that would run from Muscle Creek out onto the beach, back up onto the hill, and then they'd get, get it on over to Frankport. And then they were shipping all of that tan bark to uh, Russia because that, they were the only ones that were tanning hides at that time. Hmm. And so tan oak, tan oak, the tan bark, and then for they, tanning hides. For tanning hides. Uh, tell us about Fourth uh, of July and John Benoni and the wreck. I'm not sure there was a Fourth of July. I can't oh. remember the, the family reunion, wasn't it? Well, no. We talked about it at, at, later at the family reunions, but. Uh, John Benoni Sweet, my granddad, uh, uh, was he and and my uncle Ed Ellington uh, were on their way down to see us. Now this would have been in see, I was born in twenty three, and we've already been down to the Arizona in about a year. And so I was pretty darn young yet when this happened. Oh, I see. And uh, anyway, they were on their way down to see us at the Arizona Inn. And just before they got to the Arizona Inn, there were some real twisty curves up there. It's steep mountains, steep hills. Very steep, yeah. And terrible driving conditions. And. Uh, they were in what, a Model A or Model T or, you know? I think it was a Model A, but I'm not sure. It may have been a Model T. Anyway, they drove off the road before they got down to the Arizona Inn. They were on the slope coming down to the Inn. Went off the road and hit a great big Douglas fir tree, a huge one. And it broke both of their necks. And then when they hit that tree, it snapped both of their necks. And they both died. And, but they lived for maybe, I don't know, day, two days, or whatever it was. Later. So you got them down to the Arizona Inn. Yeah, we got them down there to the Inn. And no first aid, no doctors? Nobody at all. So they just laid there on the dining room table and over the next day or two died, is that yeah. right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. All you could do back then. That's all you could do back in those days. Uh, if something like that happened, you just didn't have any way to take care of them. Tell us about the when they opened the bridge in Gold Beach, and tell me about the Indians. That's right. The, the bridge was built in 1932, and that was 1,932 feet long. Everybody in the county wanted to be there for the dedication of it. So mom and dad took us down there too, the four of us kids. And we got onto the bridge, we're driving across it, and I remember mom saying, oh look, there's a bunch of Indians. And I thought, that's the end of me right there. I, there's, there's no two ways they've got me right now. And so uh, uh, we got on down toward where they were, and I thought, well, when we get down there, that's the end of me. So that, that'll be the end of where I go right there. And so uh, all I could do was hug her down in the back seat and hope like heck they couldn't see me. Because <laughs> there have been Indian wars there up on the lower road for not too far back. Well, no, because that Giesel Monument, that's what it was all about. Uh, the man by the name of Giesel had settled there and built himself what he called a fort. But the Indians came there and completely wiped it out. After you were alive, the Indians, there were still Indian wars? Yeah, they were still fighting wars down there. <laughs> you bet Curry <laughs> you know So that. you were less than 10 years out of Indian wars when you were there at the bridge opening. Yeah, yeah. And so I thought, well, that's... They're there to get you. They were there. That was why they were there. They were going to get me. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, you're the only one in our family that was there ever seriously worried about being involved with an Indian war. Yeah, I think so. So anyway, we, uh, in 1936, uh, we owed, I don't know how much money we owed on the Arizona Inn, but we didn't have it paid for. And all of the people that had loaned that money wanted their money. And so that meant that we uh, couldn't pay it. So we lost the Arizona Inn in 1936. And we moved from the Arizona Inn and out to the mouth of Sixers River because W.J. Sweet was one of the big owners of the Arizona Inn mortgage. And uh, he also had a big ranch out at the mouth of Sixers River. And so he said, finally said, well, we're going to take you off the Arizona Inn. You won't have a place to live anymore. But I'll give you a place to live at the mouth of Sixers River on a ranch that I have out there. And so we moved from there in 1936 and uh, out to the mouth of Sixers River. And believe me, that was different to move out there. Now I've got a whole new life ahead of me. A whole completely new life for me after that point of the game. Thank you.